So welcome to another board game review from theplayersaid.com. My name's Alexander. Did I almost you forgot my own name. Did you forget? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Grant. Oh, he didn't forget. <laughs> so, or am I Alexander? Uh, today we played Versailles 1919. Not a war game. No, definitely a, not a war. A Euro-style, historically themed board game. And this is part of the Great Statesman yep. series. Which also has Churchill in it. Yep. And, and Pericles. Pericles. Mm -hmm. uh, although this is very different from that. From both of those. Once again, this is very Euro. Yes. So, and what I mean by Euro is it's, you know, bits and cubes and you're moving stuff around. It's resource management yes. and cards. But I'm going to be honest, this game's fun. Yes. It's this very is, fun. And it's very fun. It's mostly resource management because you're using your political influence. That's your color cubes. Yeah. You're using them to bid on issues. The issues give you symbols. Symbols equate to points, right? Yeah. So it, it, in that way, it's So very, you're very collecting Euro based on whatever... What are these called again? I'm trying to... Those are the strategy cards. Strategy cards. You're trying to focus on getting those in your tableau, but some of those... You play off other people's tableaus. Yes. So when they choose those things, you're like, oh, good. He chose the industry token. I'm isolationist. I got a point. Yes. So it, it's a little bit of that. If you if you know they're going to take a certain thing, you're okay if they get that, other than the points on the card. So, so this is, uh, for me, this is a four-player game. I, d I don't know that it would be really good. Three-player would be fine. Two would be very hard to play. Two, there's like a two-player well. variant in there. And then solo, there's like a, a solo, there's an AI bot that you play around Which I still want well. to try that. We have not tried that. I do, I do want to get this on the table and try it. But <clears throat> for me, this style of game, I like it with lots of players. Oh, yeah. And this can fit four and it's, you know, first off, <clears throat> you get the good social aspect. There's, yep. a, there's a bit, you know, there's a bit of table talk and negotiation of like, don't leave that, leave that, I can't believe you're screwing me over, please yeah, don't yeah, do this yeah. to me. There's a bit of that. But <laughs> no, also, no, not again. Oh, yeah. no. But there's also, the more people there are, there's like there's an element of bidding in this game, yes. and that makes that stuff more um, a little bit more spicy for me. I like yeah. to have lots of, lots of people. Yeah, if it's just that. me or you bidding against each other, it's, it's like... It's not as fun. I mean, it's still... Good, but it's not. It's not as fun. Yeah, I, or, or or as interactive. To me, it's more. Yeah, it's more interactive, more dynamic with, with yeah. the full play. And we've played this twice. Yes, we played this version. We played it as a prototype. Yeah, which uh, actually, I, I I think some of the cards were tweaked. I'm not sure. Yeah, a majority because at that point it was pretty late in the game. Yeah, if there were changes made, it was on. You know, it's though this had two symbols. Maybe now it's one. one or, yeah, you know, but the core the core was basically identical. Yeah, um, we played that at WBC with Mark Herman. He's and one of the Mo. designers and Mo from Mo's Gaming Table. Yeah. So this is it's a Mark Herman design, but it was designed in conjunction with Jeff Engelstein. Mm -hmm. um, they of, of pandemic fame. Yes. And several other cool games as well. And the story goes, they were both independently designing for side yeah, games. Yeah, right. And both. I think they just like had they talked and were like, "Hey, oh, let's do it together." That too. So they just yeah, combined yeah. forces, and now we have this, which is and, and I would guess this is a better game because of that because they brought Most their assuredly. two ideas together. And although, as we know, Mark Herman is a great designer, and it would have been amazing with just his input, but I think Jeff added a lot of elements to it that made it a very fun game. Yes, I I feel like one of my favorite parts about this game is the tension. Yeah. Because as you look around the board, with any resource management game and you know what others are trying to do, you're kind of watching them and understanding, oh, he's only got five influence cubes left or four. I've got seven. I can win that issue. So I, I'm i going to commit. And then, you know, winning that issue, though, requires another turn to have it um, resolved. But I, I like that. I liked watching the board and understanding... Yeah. Oh, he only has one military. I have two, so I can probably outbid. I, those kind of things are fun to me. Also, looking at what others have in their tableau was so interesting. Just going, oh, Alexander just kind of helped me over there. <laughs> Unwittingly. Although, we were kind of allied. Yeah. I was France. You were Britain. It ended up that we were allied because we had one of the same victory conditions. We wanted to force Japan and Italy to not sign, yes, the which treaty. means you know if if it, if Italy and Japan have bad national happiness, 
they then won't sign the treaty because they're not happy, they don't agree with what's going on there. Yeah. So we both had that as a victory condition, so we were both trying to and we combine did. forces to push it down. We failed miserably. Pitifully at <laughs> that, which was, it's very hard, it can be very challenging to do. We, we did look at the deck and we realized, oh, there were three or four of those big hits yeah. that would have been, you know, better to move them down. Um, but, but I, yeah, but I like what that's some of the things I love about this game. So the game starts off kind of vanilla. You're just kind yeah. of playing, arguing over a couple of issues. Once there's the first successful uprising mm -hmm. out in the world, that's the point at which you then mm -hmm. pivot and you choose one the of these available cards. strategy cards. And those strategy cards focus and hone your victory points. Yes. So now you have, okay, this is how I'm going to win. So I need to focus on these three or four things yep. that are listed on my strategy card. So then it, it kind of formed a pseudo alliance with us mm -hmm. for, for some of those things, but we're also working separately, you know, and I'm, independently. I'm trying to get yep. a bunch of empire tokens, yep. you're trying to get a bunch of industry tokens, yep. so you're agreeing on some things, fighting on some things, fighting with them on some things, agreeing yeah. with them on some things. And so the dynamic between all the players to me is very interesting. You yeah. have something in common with most people, but a lot of things at odds with everyone else yes. as well. Uh, and those are the kind of interactions that I love in board games. Mm -hmm. To me, Euro games can often be quite dry with just changing colored cubes and mixing things around. And, and Which there is some points. of this, right? It's Yes. But there does feel that added level yeah. of tension. What I like in, in games that are like that, it's got, it's got bidding, love bidding, yeah. outbidding people on different things. Um, I like fun. the concept of actual player interaction when i yep. make a choice it has significant consequences for you getting some victory points for you getting hosed for you doing some other things yeah uh where things actually mean stuff and i'm not just playing i'm not playing a solitaire game together like a lot of tableau builders and things can feel right. that way this where one you're is just like focused in yeah front of i'm you trying to get time. my stuff and i'm trying yeah. to do it before you this yeah is, this is not like that it doesn't feel like that to me yeah so i'm going to go back to the comment that you made about the first uprising and the strategy card selection yes so i i really enjoy that first three or four rounds because you just you have no idea what you're doing yeah you're, you're kind of looking at these going but this cover covers everything right yep. right it's very hard but what i had done is i had kind of narrowed it down to a couple of things because this one was like oh bonus happiness and i was like i, I can do that. that that's something i can do but then it's like when that uprising happens, the starting gun goes off. Yes. And then everybody is now in order of how many territory points you have. Yeah. You, you then select. So you might have your eye on something, but then if you're choosing you go last, before me, it might not be available. Yeah. So now you're like, oh, I got so, to so that, different now. I really like that analogy of the starting, the starting gun for a race. And I felt that because after that... It became much more focused. I think each of us were trying to hone in on it, well, those it three or four stakes. Yeah. Significantly, yeah, and it makes it more, a little more cutthroat too, because I was sometimes trying to resolve issues that I may have not wanted because I wanted another issue down. You know, though you have to make those choices, and I know you're you're sitting there going, "Well, we haven't talked about all the mechanics," but. Oh, it's, it's a very this, really this game is very simple. I I think it's, it's mechanically not complicated, yeah. right? It's it's fairly straightforward. There's a great sequence of play. In fact, one of the things I really loved on the board is the numbers. First, you do this. There's a big one there. Yeah. Decide an issue. Resolve an issue. Then you go and do the event for the the personality yeah, the conference event. Yep. And and then you just follow it. I loved that because that really helps us guide. And we were playing with our brother-in-law and our father-in-law, who are gamers but aren't necessarily, I guess, this style of game. Although they well, play they don't play too. this style of game, right? They don't play war games at all. Um, but yeah, I really liked that. But that starting gun element's really cool. The tension over the influence is such a great thing, and there's a lot of ways to mitigate that from the events, from uh, you, you know, different benefits on the cards. I, I don't know. I just really, it all works together really well. Yeah, I, 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 when we played this for the first time, this is the kind of game, or the kind of not war game that's right up my alley. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is, but I like the kind of games where 
I can talk to other players to try and influence them to do things. Yeah. But when I take an action, the consequences are not just for myself. It's right. not like, oh, I gained a thing. Well, I might do, but you it might lose a thing. Yeah. You might also gain a thing. Something else might happen. Yeah. Uh, and there's, like you said, the, when you're actually playing it, uh, you know, on your turn, you can do one political action, mm -hmm. which is a list. There's a choice of three things you can do. Yeah. And then you may do one military action, which there's a choice of two mobilize or demobilize. Like it's yeah. when you're actually it's your turn, you're not faced with a ton of options, but the things you do with those, yeah. you know, there's 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 five, options on there's the board, five events on the table or five um, issues issues on the table, and it's like, well, which ones do you go for? You got to go for a couple, yeah. And then it's, well, how much influence do I want to commit to that? Mm. Do I actually think I'm going to win it? Or do I try to do something else? So whilst there are a number of choices, it's not overwhelming in any way. No. Which is why I think it was really easy to sit down with John and Brum and play yeah. this. Uh, and this was the first time they've ever played it. Right. And, and, and Brum actually ended up winning by like six points or yeah, something. Yeah, rules teach was easy. Yeah. And everyone it, got it. It went, uh, you know, after a couple of turns, everyone's... I, I think we played... Two and a half hours, but that did include some of the initial did it, did teach. It, was it even that long? Um, we started a little after nine and we finished about, about eleven. Yeah, so it was like two hours. Two hours. Right at two hours. And because and, it's there's a timer in the deck. Yes, and you can lengthen this game if you want. Yeah. By putting that timer elsewhere, you can make this ten or fifteen issues longer if you were so inclined. I, I you almost don't need to. I almost felt like though some of my issues, I'm like, oh, it'd have been nice to been able to try to build a little more. Yeah. But I actually ended up ultimately ending the game because it made sense because I didn't want him to get more points from other things. And part I knew of, he was in the lead. Part of that helps the replay value and the randomness. You yes. can't you can't count cards in this because no. half the cards might not be that might not show up. Yeah. I, I, like whereas things like Twilight Struggle, you're like, oh, he's played this card already. Yeah. And this one, and I know that this one's coming up because he hasn't played it yet. And this one, you're like, well, I don't know what issues are going to yeah. come up because twenty of them won't. Yeah, and, and the, so so there's an element of you're you're at the mercy of what's in there, and it's trying to make the best out of what kind of comes up. Yeah, which I think is interesting reflection on what Versailles is as a game. You're 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 playing a game of trying to put together the Treaty of Versailles to end World War One. Yeah, to to try and carve up the peace after the armistice, and to decide <clears throat> really important world and global issues. Mm. Uh, and 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 not being able to kind of know what's going to come up. Oh, oh, this yeah. thing. You know, some of the, all these issues didn't come up. Things right, there like, were fifteen there that yeah, didn't come up. Korea, Kurdistan, Arabia, or like all these other things we didn't we didn't get to right before the the treaty was signed, kind of thing. And it, it's just neat little bits of history like that where I don't know it reflects the time constraints that they were under because because the Axis, well, not Axis, but the Germans were desperately wanting just to have it over with, just to yeah. see what the terms were. Right. So they they didn't have you know years and years and years to to to, to sort out everything. A lot of the things were rushed, <laughs> and there were consequences to those. Yeah. And you get and, to and, play that out. And the other interesting thing is the three major powers. They didn't really care what Japan and Italy thought. You know they they were trying to run through it, and you know Britain and yeah. France and you make a America. concession here or there. Yeah. But it was like. But it was like, we're going to keep ourselves happy, and eh, if you're happy too. So ultimately, one of the great things about you know the Treaty of Versailles and really every treaty to every war ever that's ever been ended, it ultimately led to World War II because of the way they did it, because Germany felt like they weren't given any voice, and it was too... Which they, which they won. Well, well, they were the loser, right? But then some of the other countries, like Italy and Japan, felt slighted, and they started saying, you know what? It's 1919. I'm going to build my empire over the next 25 years. Well, and, and that's what they did. And, and and then you get into these event cards, which are all people who were there. Yeah, who um, who were involved. Ho Chi Minh was there. Yeah, and and you know there there's a whole story with Ho Chi Minh yeah. and how that played out, uh, and how promises were made and kept, and how people were treated, and well that that led into. Vietnam. <laughs> right. It's just amazing some of the things that happened. It would have been Chiang Kai-shek, right? No, no. He was Ho Chi Minh later. Chiang Kai-shek was Chinese. Okay, what, I'm an idiot. Forget it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. 
but uh, it, it, it's it's fascinating to to kind of see some of the some of the people and there's you know they get a little blurb yeah. of text on who they are and, and some of those things so it's a nice resource as well well you learn you learn as you're playing yeah you, you know that that's another great thing i i really enjoy it it's fun yes it's a very interesting thing well one thing i want to talk about maybe we can do it let's do it in the second segment after you shoot the board sure let me show you this all and then we'll talk about some of the stuff so here's a look at the map and it kind of seems a little bit busy like there's a lot going on Looks like a Euro game, because it is one. Um, this is kind of end game state as well, so we'll hit off a couple bits and pieces. So basically the board's kind of divided into two. This is this is kind of the conference itself. You can see there's a big table. We've got two issues we're currently debating on and deciding. We have a kind of a conference guest, which has an event. And then we have here a waiting room. These are the issues that may come into play and come to the table. And then we've got a, a couple of other people that may come in and become uh, a guest in an event there as well. And then we've got some holding boxes. Uh, on this side, this is basically an abstraction of the rest of the world. We have Europe, Balkans, Middle East, Africa, and the Pacific. Uh, each of these has, these are unrest markers. And then there's some powder kegs as well, and we'll get to those in a second. But basically this is the stability of these particular regions. And if things are very unstable and we have a lot of unrest, some of the issues that were resolved and settled might become unsettled again. We also have a happiness track. Happiness uh, can get you some victory points, but also happiness dictates if you start getting down here, you dictates how many military units you can have. Uh, there's also an exhausted box, ours is absolutely chock full, and there's a demobilized track as well for your military units. Because this is 1919, you've just been fighting uh, World War One for four years, uh, people don't want to be fighting anymore, so they, you, if you demobilize and you demobilize early, you get a lot of your national happiness back. But you also sacrifice military power, which you might use for influencing uh, kind of other regions of the world. So there's there's a lot of bits and pieces that do move in this game, uh, and and figuring that out is part of the fun experience of this. Basically, on your turn, you can do a couple of things. Let's say I'm the red player. I got a bunch of... Uh, this is my political influence, which are my cubes. My discs, military. Which, you don't use those quite as often. But on my turn, I can bid on any of these five issues. These are the ones that are immediately going to be um, resolved. So it's more likely that something good might happen. Let's say I bid on this one. Because there's nothing on there, I can bid one. If I wanted to bid on this one, I would have to exceed the maximum bid. Two, four, six, eight... So I'd have to put 9 on there. I only have 8, so I can't bid on that one. When you choose the bidding option, you have to bid on two cards. So I'm going to probably just ditch one on one of these. And if you can't place on two cards, you cannot place do the bidding action. What you might do instead of bidding is one of the other options is to retrieve a bunch from the exhausted. You can get back 6 influence cubes and all of your military. So I'm going to get six cubes back and I'm going to get two military back because that's all I've got on there. But if I was to do that, I'm unable to bid. Again, you can only do one thing. The other political action that you can do is to settle an issue. What I might do, I'm the red player, I'm going to settle this issue. Now, I don't have anything, any skin in this game. If I did, let's say it looked like this, I would because I'm settling it for someone else, the white player is going to win this. I get my influence piece back. That's very nice. It's, it's like you're doing a good deed for someone. You you gain your political mouse back, basically. All of these become exhausted. Half of these become exhausted, rounded down. So three get exhausted. The blue player gets four of them back. And this goes to the white player. The white player then chooses which of these options get enacted. So if they're going for, for uh, so this is um, uh, Togoland and Cameroon, they might decide it goes to France, in which case they get a French Empire token on here, and America, it, it, it doesn't like it. This is one of those um, errors that we talk about. This should be an unhappiness symbol, not a fist. Uh, if they chose for Togoland and Cameroon to be independent, there would be a self-determination uh, self marker, and France would be unhappy about it. 
And in this one, if it goes to the UK, UK get an Empire marker, France is, unha France is unhappy, and Africa would gain an Unrest marker. And that means this goes up, which means it's more likely that uh, an uprising is gonna, gonna happen. But either way, the player, the white player that this goes to, and the white player in this game is America, gets three points, and they get to determine what happens. So they're gonna pick independence, for example. You get put a little token on it, of the self self determination and France goes down one happiness. Boo hoo! They don't like it. They got kind of hosed on that issue, and then it goes in front of the uh, the American player. Having done that, that was the first thing we do. Then, when we're settling an issue, then we do this event, and this says, "Player with lowest happiness, all of tide, exhausts six influence." Well, America has the lowest happiness, so. They they uh, exhaust six influence, and if they don't have any, it's it's you know it's as many as they can up to six. So that's really bad for the American player. Uh, then this gets discarded. Then because the person who chose to settle the issue, not the person who won the issue, the person who chose to settle the issue, then picks the next one to go onto the table, and I'm gonna pick this one to go onto the table. And then they choose which of these two comes down here. And so you look at the event optional. Add two unrest to the Pacific, add one powder keg to the Middle East, then check for uprising. I don't have any skin in the game in the Middle East, but other people do. So I'm going to do this to try and screw them over. Then the fourth thing is to get a new issue into the uh, waiting room. What I can do is I can pay an zero influence to put the top of the discard in. I can pay one influence to take the second card or two influence to take the third card. That's pretty expensive. Or you can take two off the top and pick one. And we're gonna pick, these are not great, honestly. So we're gonna pick this one. Have, and this one gets discarded. And then the last thing we do, number five, is we flip this and there's a little event that goes off. We do an uprising check. When we do an uprising check, we consult this section of the board this section of the board, we look at which uprising marker is the furthest to the right, which this is this one. So what we do is we roll a d6 and see if it uh, gets triggered. And we roll on a 4+, plus, we're going to have an uprising. And we roll a 5, so yes, there will be an uprising. What we then do is we consult all the different players, look at all of the settled issues that they have. They might have a bunch of these issues kind of out. And whoever has the most Middle East ones, uh, so let's say the French player has both of these issues settled. They have two, no one else has one. Whoever's got the most Middle East issues puts their most uh, expensive point value one into the middle of the board. These are both the same, so they get to choose. So we put one in the middle. And then what we do is we basically fight over this issue which was settled politically, now we fight over it militarily. The person who, whose issue this was gets to play first. So let's say it was the Italian player. What they do is, instead of putting influence cubes on it, uh, they're going to put military on it. So they're going to put one military on it. Um, let's say the, uh, the blue player, the French, doesn't have any military because they're all demobilized. Uh, the British player might put two on there because they want to win it. And then the Italian player is like, okay, well, I'll put two and then I can tie break with an influence. And then the British player says, well, I'll put two more on there because I really want to win this thing. And the Italian player says, I pass, or if they don't have anything. Basically, whoever's got the most military wins because it's a tie, we go to influence. In this instance, influence is a tiebreaker. So... This used to be an Italian issue, and now it goes over to the British player. So we just had a four, an eight-point victory point swing between those two players. I get the issue, and then I get to resettle and redecide what what thing happens. So I might then uh, choose. Oh, I'm going to do this and make the U.S. very unhappy. Boom. However, because I sent a bunch of troops in to settle that issue, this is post World War One. My home nation doesn't like that. All of this becomes exhausted. 
and I lose one influence per military unit I committed to that. Uh, because we're, we're, we're surely we're done with the warmongering at this point. So, whilst you do get victory points, it hurts you in the happiness, which can cost you victory points, or it can cost you other things in, in the long run. So, there's a lot of neat choices to be made there, doing all that kind of stuff. So, that's that, that but that was all part of the settlement issue. Um, for demobilizing, simply you put a. You, this and this track goes from five down to one. You put one of your military units permanently here in the game, and you only have three. This can never come back out. You are done with this unit for the whole game. You will only have two for the rest of the game, but you gain five happiness. So it's a nice way to get a bunch of points back for if if you're you know getting screwed. But these have diminishing returns. It's only four, three, two, 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 one. If you're playing a four-player game. Uh. On top of that, the other thing you can do with your military units is you can put them in these regions over here. You can put it here, and what this is going to do is it acts as kind of a buffer for unrest. You're literally like, you know, policing military police, military occupation. So what this means is is that you'll never get you'll never get these down here where they're going to have an uprising on a two plus, which is really easy. You're using this as a blocking mechanism, but it's a heavy commitment. And I'll be honest. A lot of these event cards were like minus one happiness for each deployed troop. Again, because people don't want they don't want the troops to come home at this point. But it it helps to protect your uh, political uh, assets and and uh, your your colonies and global territories around the world. So there's a lot of decision making to be made there. The last thing that we'll talk about real quick are, are these um, strategy cards. There's five of them. And once you trigger the first uprising, you then, from uh, lowest to highest points, so this is the lowest, whoever's got the fewest victory points gets to choose one of these as, as their kind of win conditions, basically, is, is the rest of what they're going for. And, and these are nice because it's like uh, Woody Wilson's 14-point plan, and, which is, you know, uh, we're going to contain Germany, self-determination for everyone, we do want the world to come together, so we want Japan and Italy to both sign the treaty. And uh, we're going to... per If I'm going to try to solve a bunch of uh, League of Nations issues... See, this one says League, just above that five victory points. I'm trying to solve a bunch of those because I want the League of Nations to succeed. It was his brainchild. Or I might go for isolationism, which means I get plus one for every industry token out there. Plus one for every self-determination token out there. I don't want Italy or Japan to sign the treaty. But I will get a bonus for two times my own happiness. And the happiness is like six if you're the most, four if you're next, two and zero. So if you can keep that up, you can get 12 points out of that if you are the most happy doing your own thing, being an isolationist. These are really neat little historical tips. But they also act as really nice ways to change up the victory points. And there's a bunch of these. You deal one more than the players you have. And like this. I mean, there's a whole bunch we didn't even use in this. So it's really nice and keeps the game fresh as well. So that's kind of some of the core mechanics of this. It's settling issues for yourself to gain victory points and affect the board. Or you might make a deal with someone. I'm going to settle this for you because you've got the most. But I'll let it happen now. But I want you to maybe help me out on this one. But that's not binding. So there's some little wheeling and dealing that you can try to do. But it's trying to gain victory points in this Euro game, um, and what we'll do is we'll wrap up with a few final thoughts. So that was a look at the board and some of the mechanics. Again, not particularly complicated. Um, no. Not a war game. <laughs> no. Uh, but a great game. It's a yeah, very I, good game. I like this style of game. Yes. This is this is right up my alley. I've yeah. been waiting for this to come out since we played it two yep. days ago. So one thing I did want to talk about, so this is the third game in the Great Statesman series. Yes. They're really all very different. Very different. You know, Churchill was the first, and it used that conference table mechanic, where really your resources, i.e. the influence in this game, were the op values on your leaders, yeah. your uh, participants in the, in the discussions. So there's some similarity there. Pericles, I think, was, was a little bit different, although there's some of those elements as well. Yeah, some of the card play was similar in that one, right. but the way that the uh, the conflicts played out was entirely, entirely different. different. It was like a whole actual war game. Yeah, I, I felt like Pericles was 
way more of a war game than both Churchill and yeah. and Versailles. Yeah. I mean, Churchill had the, you know, you had your little cubes and, and you were actually fighting with... But that was, it was, you were just moving up tracks. Yeah, it, it wasn't, and, yeah. And it was, how quickly can we do that? Right. Whereas... Pericles, Pericles you had can, a full tactical board. Yeah, you can yeah. go all over the place. Yeah. Take this granary here and build a navy here. And so so really the thing I like about this system is they're they're all very different. Yeah. If you've played one, you didn't like it, you know, get give one of these others a, an opportunity. You know, Versailles is the most is the latest one. Yes. It's probably the least war gamey of the three. Probably the simplest of the three. Um, and the simplest of the three, but I still think it creates that very interesting dichotomy of you do have to work with people at the table. I mean, you really do. Yes. There were times I'm like, yeah, I really shouldn't do that because I know Alexander and are are trying to force them to not sign the treaty, but it's like Sometimes I, I had to do it because it was best for me, ultimately. Yeah, you're like, I, I'm going to sacrifice this element because I need the points and prestige for this. Right. You know. Because I feel like that's a better benefit to me. Ultimately, that not signing was the reason <laughs> well. we lost. That was like a 12-point swing. Uh. Um, but, but I still love, there's still that interaction, that negotiation. I also feel like this game is going to reward you if you play three, four, five times you understand the conditions, you understand what you're looking for, and it's going to lead to a lot more negotiation. You know, it's going to lead to maybe some some horse trading like, "Hey, don't don't do that." Or if you do that, make sure you take this because then we can both benefit because you are kind of yeah. sometimes allied with people. I really like that element of it and that's one of the reasons I love Churchill so much. Is you're really kind of working together but you're working against each other. For your own self-interest, and sometimes you're like, "Okay, I'm going to move this up. I don't want to, but I, I got to get it going." I feel like of all the games, though, this is the one where working together is it, it, you. You do it a bit more. You do. You're, I don't think there's a. Question. But I feel like the other ones are a bit more like it's a minute for myself. Yeah, right. This one, like, you, yeah, because some of your victory games are the same. So, yep. so you're very much like, okay, well. We happen to work together for this, so yeah. let's let's go hard on that. Eh, I'll do my other stuff on the side yeah. as well. It was funny one time during the game. I think I called you out. I'm like, "Hey, I haven't seen you do any of these, <laughs> you know, take away happiness from Japan and and Italy." And you were like, "Well, I haven't had the opportunity." <gasps> Bull crap! I called foul, <laughs> and then immediately you did something because yes. you realize, "Oh, we're running out of time." Um, but yeah, really good game. There were a couple errors errors with the cards. Yeah, and they're, they're known errors apparently. Right. So there's a couple of cards out there where they just printed the wrong symbols mm -hmm. on them. They put like unrest, which is a clenched fist, instead versus of an unhappiness. unhappiness. Yeah. So there's a couple of those. That Not were, a big deal. Um, but like we immediately saw them like, oh, that's weird. Looked it up and they're like, yeah, this is a misprint. So so it we even it begged the question, all you got to do is play this game one time and it, you would think that that mistake would be readily apparent as you reviewed it. But... I don't know how that process is done. Well, um, yeah, or if if it's just like at the printers they remove or something. They, they forgot to tag a layer and or something. Or something like that. But rule book is twenty pages. Yeah, there is a whole massive playbook which I haven't even looked at because I don't need to. I wonder if the playbook is more focused on the solitaire. Uh, it's got bot. some solitaire. It's a lot of examples of play. Okay, and then some design notes and stuff. Got it. But this is a really easy game to learn. The rule book's very good. Uh, I don't think. There was like one bit where I was a little bit like, man, eh, that's kind of vague. Well, we were we were a little confused by one of the victory conditions yep. at the end and because that's it, in the rule book that's on the card it, vague. it's kind of clear what it does, and then but then you read in the rule book, oh, you don't get that. Actually, we didn't read it in the rule book. Well, the rule book is also quite vague, right? So I I think the scorecard actually helped us. You just double your victory, card. your yeah. happiness. If value. you got six, you get twelve. You don't yeah. get double that plus the six. Yes. I liked the scorecard too. You, you know, yeah. those, there's a lot of those. It's a pad of what about 30, 30 pages, double sided, probably 20 give or take pages. twenty pages. So you know, you play this game forty times, you're gonna have these little scorecards, and I really like that. We thought some of the order should have been yeah differently because it's a little bit misleading, slightly. But if you've played any Euro games, that's also entirely unnecessary. It's just a nice bling because yeah, we all I thought it was nice. add up to the calculator. Well, <laughs> right? yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's it's a nice thing to have. I, I, the components are fantastic. Everything looks great. Pre-rounded counters. 
The cubes are really awesome. The cards are great. They're big. I actually, we talked about this. I felt like the symbols needed to be bigger. The card's so big, make these symbols a little well, bigger. Well, yeah, because you're pouring a bunch of cubes on top of right. them. And so you cover half of it up. Yeah. Doing that. And that happens. But overall, I really enjoyed this game. I think it, one of the board games we've played this year, definitely, I think, one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I've literally been looking forward to this game for about two years now. Yeah. Since we played it the first time. And it, and it lives up to my memory of what it is. Yep. Which was amazing because of who we played it with, but it holds up as a game no matter who you play it with yeah. as well. Had a very good time with this. So I this like is Versailles 1919 by GMT Games. It's available now, brand new. Four player game. You can play it with fewer. Three player would yep. be fine. So After low, you that, you so start low. to get into variants though, where they change some bits and pieces and there's yeah. some extra components. Uh, but if you can get three or four people together. So if you play with two, do you represent like Italy and, and Japan? If you play with two, you don't play with Italian player. Play okay. With two, whoever you're not with, there's I think there's some a bot that controls okay. the third. Okay. Player. I'm I not I'm entirely sure, but I'm never gonna play it with two. I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. not. If I'm, this if, is a great. If it's just the two of us. We'll play. Something well, else. this is a great convention game. Yes. We would take this and play it with four people and really have a blast. So yes. really liked it. Very good game. Yes. So Versailles 1919 from GMT Games. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I've been Alexander from the Players Aid.com. And I'm Grant.